Hi, my name is Katie Kalaitis, and I'm the resident scholar at the National Hellenic Museum. And you're about to watch my conversation with Maureen Santilli about the role of the Greek War of Independence and American Philhellenism more generally in early American reform movements. Professor Santilli is assistant professor at Northern Virginia Community College. She holds a bachelor's degree in classics and history at the, from the University of Montana and a master's degree and PhD in American history from George Mason University. Her PhD dissertation, The Greek Fire, The Greek War of Independence, and the Emergence of American Reform Movements, 1780 to 1860, was published in December of 2020 by Cornell University Press. This is a fascinating conversation and I hope you enjoy it. So hello and welcome. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Um, so I first, um, your book, The Greek Fire, which is from Cornell University Press um, was absolutely brilliant. Could you just for those in the audience sort of summarize um, the book and sort of the topic um, of your, it was also the topic of your dissertation research, I believe, right? Yes, yeah, so uh, the, the book, is uh, it's about a lot of things, but it it looks at the American popular support for the Greek Revolution, why they would have been especially interested in the Greek Revolution as opposed to maybe other revolutions happening at the time, and then exp it explores uh, the ways in which that they supported the revolution, uh, the different groups of people, the kinds of responses that they they made for the revolution. And then ultimately I connect it with what kind of impact did the Greek revolution have on the United States itself. And I argue that it's, it's, it wasn't just this event that piqued some interest for a few years. It actually had a really important impact on uh, how Americans viewed slavery, for example, uh, the rights of women. And I ultimately say that the rhetoric used in the American Philhellenic movement came to be adopted by the by various American reformist groups. And we see the consequences and the influence of the American Philhellenic movement for decades after, um, all the way through the 19th century. That's okay. So we're gonna we're gonna try to take that apart in pieces um, for everyone at home. And I'm gonna we're gonna move chronologically. How about okay, how about yeah. that? Um, so can you sort of start by talking about maybe the the early place of, of classics and Hellenism in, um, in, of course, in sort of the late American colonies and then in the early Republic? Sure. So the, the classics played an important part in terms of, um, I mean, really for elite education, especially, of course, in the colonies. Uh, this is, of course, the influence of the Enlightenment all the way through the 1700s. The Enlightenment, of course, plays an important part in the ideas behind the revolution, why the American colonists thought that they should declare independence, and, and so on and so forth. But then that foundation um, in the classics, and, and what I, what I, when I say classics, I mean both Greek and Roman sources, but especially it's more Roman focused in the 1700s. Um, Americans felt that they needed to adopt a new identity in a lot of ways. They wanted to distance themselves from their so-called Britishness. Uh, they wanted a new sort of ancestry, if you will. And so we see the importance of the classics in terms of building this new identity. And we also see that in the foundation of our government as well. What interested me though, was my research began in the late 1700s where you see this emphasis on Rome. But ultimately by the time we get to the 1820s, there is a more dramatic influence, I guess, of uh, from the Greek influence on Americans. And so that was the initial spark that brought me to looking at this topic. And when I examined the 1820s more carefully, uh, you know, first of all, in the US, there is this bigger push for a more democratic participation in government. But that also jived with the Greek Revolution and this sort of awakening that, you know, we are 
intellectually linked with the Greeks. And so we as Americans, because we A, fought our own revolution, but because of our so-called ancestry, if you will, in the classics, we have to support the Greeks. And so there really is this, it's, it's like, almost like this intellectual bloodline that they think that they share. There's also sure religion is an aspect as well. Uh, the fact that the Greeks are Christian, um, that plays a, a, a dynamic part as well. Um, but uh, I have lost sight of your question. <laughs> no, 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 I'm, it's a, we'll, we can, we'll give you another, we'll, we'll, okay. we'll, we'll give um, I, I was, I'm sort of, I, actually, I'll have you ask, answer this question. Do you think it was, was it the Greek revolution that, spurred this sort of interest in the Greeks, this sort of shift from Greece to Rome in the American consciousness, or was it just part of this larger trend in American life towards greater democratization that sort of paralleled with the Greek revolution? Yeah, I think it's part of a larger trend in terms of how Americans come to embrace the Greek revolution as being very much a part of that movement. Um, you know, there were a number of uh, new archeological discoveries beginning in the early 1800s, Napoleon's uh, conquest of Egypt, for example. Um, but uh, there's also this uh, interest in um, claiming antiquities. So of course, Lord Elgin and the Parthenon marbles are the most famous of these, but there are other examples of, uh, of these sorts of acquisitions, if you will. And so um, Americans were very much aware of that, that piqued their interest. There of course were debates within the United States, even at that time about whether that was appropriate to remove antiquities and take them to places like the British Museum, right? <laughs> but um, the know your audience here. <laughs> right, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the Philhellenic movement, of course, begins, I mean, you can argue it, Thomas Jefferson is very much a part of the early stages in the late 1700s. Then you, of course, have Lord Byron. Americans, of course, love Lord Byron's poetry. So um, it, it, it happens as part of that larger um, international movement but I would say that the combination of that international movement along with the movement towards a more democratic uh, approach to involvement in politics in the United States. So by the 1820s, the US had moved towards universal white male suffrage. It's of course the age of Andrew Jackson, the guy who's supposedly the defender of the common man. So all of that meshes, if you will, with this, this uh, interest in supporting Greece, the birthplace of democracy. That, so that's really interesting. And how does that sort of, and I, one of the things I found incredibly fascinating in your book was the ways that sort of maps on to American reform movements, right? And the ways that um, sort of even between North and South, people are um, starting to, sort of between, sorry, I'll, I'll say that again. What I thought was interesting was the ways that, you know, we sort of think of that North-South divide as impenetrable in, in antebellum in America, but the Philhellenic, the Philhellenic movement seems to span that and be adopted in these sort of different and interesting ways. I'd love to hear you comment on that. And then yeah. I'll have a follow-up question about slavery. Sure, yeah. So we first really start to see the emergence of sectionalism. Of course, it existed before the 1820s to some extent, but we really start to see it as a, a clear problem, if you will, <laughs> beginning in 1820 um, with the Missouri Compromise. And uh, you know, Thomas Jefferson famously said that uh, the, the Missouri Compromise essentially drew on the, the, the face of the United States on, on the map of where slavery would be allowed and where it would not. And so it's now very much that debate is ingrained now in American politics and there's no going back. Um, but interestingly, the Greek revolution, which of course begins just one year later, 1821, um, I found widespread national consistent support for the Greek revolution. So much so that in fact, I had my advisor, I've had uh, additional readers for the book um, questioning, no, there couldn't have possibly been 
international <laughs> support for freeing the Greeks, like surely slavery <laughs> came into this conversation. And so I particularly looked for that division because everyone that was talking to me expected to find it. And I, it honestly, in all of the newspapers I looked in and all the books that I looked in, it's, it's really not there. It's certainly not pronounced. Um, slavery, yeah, the enslavement of the Greeks, is um is wrong in the eyes of southerners because the greeks are are white yeah and um so that really didn't pose uh a uh, <laughs> good thing we're recording this right um it it didn't pose an intellectual conflict for them or a moral conflict because slaves in the United States are of African descent and uh, Greeks are of course white and they're from like the greatest race on earth, uh, this ancient uh, race uh, tracing its lines back to Pericles and beyond, right? So for the South, it, 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 they really don't even mention it. Um, I don't find any commentary about that sort of conflict of interest until the late 1820s, when we really start to see the abolitionist movement turning towards immediatism. And it's a more radical approach to abolitionism rather than gradual emancipation, we should free the slaves right away. This is um, uh, William Lloyd Garrison, um, David Walker, uh, and, and many others who are informed by this idea that slavery is wrong, period, and we need to end it in our borders. And then they observe, how is it that we across the nation, including Southerners, are so horrified at the enslavement of the Greeks in the midst of their revolution? How can, how can you be so shocked when we ourselves have slavery within our own borders? So I don't really start to see division until uh, 1826, 1827. So from 1821 until 1826, it's almost like this, it's one major unifying movement um, between the North and South. That is, that's really fascinating. And one of the things that kind of struck me as you were talking is that, you know, certainly when Greek immigrants start arriving in America in the 1890s, um, for a huge period of that time, they're sort of seen as not white, right? So right. decidedly <laughs> not white. So when they actually, when the Greeks actually show up, um, certainly, certainly not black, and that's a different sort of racial history. But yeah, this idea that they're sort of not white once they actually show up. So yeah, it's it's um, uh, there, and I, I talk I, I talk about this in my book about race and how yeah. the ancient Greeks are white, and in fact, um, this is connected with classical art. So um, when uh, you have people trying to classify race in the early 19th century, they reference classical statuary, like the, the Apollo <laughs> Belvedere, for example, is used as this, this is the paragon of what humans should look like. This, this denotes intelligence. This is superiority. And so when people are thinking about the Greeks, they're not thinking of the modern Greeks, they're thinking of the ancient Greeks and they fit into this mold for them that of course is not based completely in historical reality. They're, this is the, the identity that they've sort of crafted for the Greeks, right? That it's, it's yeah. somehow different. And if actually, and I'm sorry, I'm getting tongue tied. Um, yeah. This actually also links with um, like Thomas Jefferson and others even talk about the modern Greek language, that the modern Greek language is not pure, that it needs to be returned to the ancient Greek language. And Jefferson writes a number of friends saying, oh, it wouldn't be very difficult to reform or purify the modern Greek language and get it back to the language of Pericles. And so we, we even see that in, in the language that you know, they're not perfect, but oh, we can make them perfect if we just remind them of their ancient roots, like as if the modern Greeks have forgotten or something. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that makes Thomas Jefferson a proponent of Kafu Revusa. Um, so he's the bane of every student of modern Greek ever. So. <laughs> yes. 
Yes. But so actually the movement once independence happens to purify the language. Yes. Um, so he, yeah. So good job, Thomas Jefferson. He really <laughs> is having a bad run lately. <laughs> yes. Really. The more you find out about him. Um, so th that's really, that's really interesting. And I, I would like to, I'd like to come back to this question of religion because I think um, I'm really interested in how, or if sort of these, these early Americans how they kind of conceptualized Eastern Christianity. Um, certainly the fact the Greeks were Christian sort of aids sympathy to their cause, but is there any concept of that? How does that jive with American anti-Catholicism? Um, yes. Yeah. So that's another really interesting sort of like, it's like two perceptions of the modern Greeks existed within the minds of early Americans. So yeah, they, I mean, there are countless speeches made, pamphlets printed, talking about how Americans need to support the Greek revolution because they, the, the Greeks are Christian and is your Christian duty to support them in their fight against the, the tyrannical Turks. And I mean, that language is just so prevalent, but you also simultaneously have these same people giving these speeches supporting missionary efforts to go abroad to Greece to, you know, establish Sunday schools in the, the ideology of early American Protestantism. They really believed that, sure, you're Christian, but uh, not the right kind of Christian, but that's okay because, you know, you're, once you come out of this uh, horrible fight against the Turks, we're, we're going to help you reclaim your civilized status. So call I mean, of course it's, it's, <laughs> it's profoundly racist in our modern eyes, right? <laughs> but um, they, they wouldn't have seen it that way. They, they honest to goodness, imagine that they were helping to elevate the Greeks and reclaim this, this uh, age of heroes that has, has from bygone age, ages. Yeah, that's, that's really, I mean, I don't think, it's, I mean, there's still mission, right? There's still Christian missionary efforts that come largely from America to Greece and Russia, um, certainly after the oh, fall. I, I didn't know that. That's interesting. <laughs> oh yeah, no, no, no. So there's, um, this is, I mean, this is something I'm really interested in, but there yeah. are, um, you know the Greek the and Greece and Greece more than Russia because Greece is part of the EU has had a lot of trouble with this because they have laws against proselytizing non-orthodox religions and all sorts of things um, precisely because orthodoxy is such an important part of modern Greek identity and national the formation of the nation state right um, but yeah there's there's missionaries who regularly um, and they've been because of the EU they've had to be allowed in I support for freedom of religion. I think they should be allowed in, but um, it's this, it's this really interesting, for me, it's this really interesting um, sort of. Yeah, it is still kind of that frame of mind, like, oh, let me help you figure out your, your, your orthodoxy. And, you know, I just need to help you correct it just a little bit. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I see I that. Mean, conversely, for, I mean, you have, you have a lot of Americans who conservative, you know, evangelical Christians who convert to orthodoxy and then go to Greece and Russia to like help the Greeks and Russians be better orthodox too, <laughs> yeah, which is like, okay. like, like a super weird thing to yeah, like, yeah, try yeah. to like, like you think you're more orthodox than my yeah yeah because probably not. <laughs> bring it on because <laughs> that would be hard for you in your day-to-day -day life yeah so that's i mean i think that's a really interesting that kind yeah, of push no, and we definitely see the start of this um and in, in fact I, I i talk about some of the first missionary efforts to greece in the book the first um um missionary uh effort sent it was called the palestine mission so their goal wasn't just to travel to Greece. Uh, they obviously also want to go to Jerusalem, et cetera. But uh, yeah, they, they, wanted to, they wanted to spread this sort of American sense of Protestantism. And um, again, it's very much wrapped up in this idea of, well, you know, the Greeks could be so much better if we just help them to realize that, right? So um, yeah, in fact, there's a, I mean, you probably don't want this in the, in the thing, but there's this great little story about how the the two guys that go on this um, this mission, so it's uh, uh, Pliny Fisk 
and I'm drawing a blank on the other guy's name, but Pliny. When first, hmm? Pliny. I mean, there's a name. I know, right? Yeah. yeah. And then he and he adopts a Greek uh, named uh, who takes the name Photius Fisk. His, uh, so I, I forget what his Greek last name was, but he takes Fisk as his last name. Um, but anyway, they uh, these two missionaries arrive in um, the U.S. or the U.S. in um, the Mediterranean, and they first arrive in um, in Italy, and they are horrified that they have to listen to the bells chiming Roman Catholics to come to church. <laughs> no, don't go to church. You're just being <laughs> led down the wrong path. And I mean, and being a Catholic, I, I'm sort of laughing out loud at that. But anyway. <laughs> No, I mean, I think I think this is a really the ways in which I mean, one thing that that struck me as as I was reading your book and sort of as I think about Philhellenism in early America and in, in early Britain to to an extent as well, is but certainly in America where the sort of American identity is being shaped is how I mean, colonialist is the wrong word, but I think there is this sort of um, pillaging of these different threads and this idea that you know, the sort of reconfiguration, this kind of Frankenstein, and then the attempt to sort of export that Frankenstein back yeah. to the people who's got body snatched. Yeah, that is, it's a complicated thing to describe, or at least I found it, yeah. it complicated because it isn't empire building in the traditional sense, but it is like almost like an intellectual colonization effort. In fact, um, one phrase I came across was like, um, they had a missionizing spirit that they wanted to bring ideas. So they have no interest in making Greece a colony or annexing Greece. I mean, they very much wanted Greece to be a republic, um, but uh, they wanted to ingrain American identity into the Greeks because they believed that, well, you know, again, we, we fought our own revolution. We know what's right. And so let us help you. And you just, you just, what you just said about they wanted Greece to be a republic. What was the American response when the Greeks went and got a two-bit German <laughs> second son to be their king? No offense. We're very, the king is the king, but yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, so I, regret not delving more into that but again um i the book i mean the book i yeah. could have been so much longer um yeah. i ultimately decided to focus more on the impact of the greek revolution and keep it an yeah. american story but i i wish i had intentionally looked into that more because in in the book i do talk about that um there are american philhellens who actually fought in the greek army who are there as agents working in concert with american philhellenic societies i mean they're receiving aid from americans etc cetera, etc cetera. and they and they are fighting in the greek army and so they they out and out say to uh some of these uh, Greek officials, Mavrokardatos, for example, is one that they talk to. And um, uh, this is, I, I think, Jonathan Peckham Miller it has an audience with him and flat out says, you guys are going to create a republic, right? Because <laughs> we're not, I'm not playing if you're not going to create a republic. And Mavrokardatos responds and says, of course, we're going to be a republic. We wouldn't accept anything else. And so Miller is satisfied with that response but i had to wonder why is he even asking the question and so then of course in looking at british archival materials i found that almost i mean very close to that meeting in time uh already there's been conversations with the uh ambassador in um in the mediterranean regarding british assistance in stepping in and aiding with the revolution. So it's almost like Miller was at least aware of that power play. And I mean, that must have, and it must have been yeah. just absolutely unavoidable to realize that, that, that the European powers are likely going to play a role in the outcome of the revolution. But um, I did not find out if Miller was outraged when uh, <laughs> they end up picking uh, you know, King Otto or not. So but I, I, I regret not doing that because it would have been fascinating to get his reaction. Be like, no, <laughs> no. Like, I, mean, I, I would assume they were disappointed. I would, I would definitely assume they were disappointed. 
like you would i mean yeah. like you would be right, right yes. i'm not so i just I, then, so to sort of go back to my guys when you said that i was like wait a second what did they think that when they were like here's otto he's gonna be king now goodbye yeah. no i i again i really i really wish i had looked in to see if they did it if we do have any sources that comment on it and i'm sure that there are but um, uh -huh. no, I, they definitely, they were, the American Philonic movement was definitely operating from the place that Greece is gonna be a Republic, just like we are. And that's what we're donating money for. Like we're not supporting anything at less. And so obviously that's not what ends up happening. Valuable lesson, get all the information before you deal with the Greeks. Just right, no, and I, <laughs> it was a, a huge aha moment. So I'm, re I'm reading about that meeting. And then I forget exactly when the coded message comes in, but it's roughly around the same time, not like it at the most a year later, there is a coded message that the British ambassador receives that it says, you know, there is interest in negotiating an end to the revolution on behalf of the Greeks, Brit the British are going to be part of this, Russia is going to be part of this, blah, blah, blah. And I just remember reading it going, Ooh, <laughs> I mean, that's like, Marvin Cordato's had to have known that they were at least thinking about that pathway when he was yeah. saying, no, we're going to be a Republic. Don't worry about don't, it. <laughs> no, yeah, that, that seems, that seems about right. Um, <laughs> but to, to go back to America, I'm um, certainly because that's the focus of the book and your oh, research. And also it's super interesting. Um, and also we could talk all day about maybe shady things the Greeks did. Um, <laughs> I can say that because I'm Greek. Um, I, so we, we talked a little bit about slavery, but can you can you talk about some of the other sort of reform movements going on in America and the role that Philhellenism and the Greek Revolution um, played in that? Yes. In those? So, so American reform in the 1820s is um, in large part based around um, like religious efforts. So like church groups, specific churches are, you know, do charitable efforts to help the poor or, um, you know, help the, the, the orphan, like orphan child, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And women were especially involved in these reform efforts. Now, women, of course, could not participate in public life. They couldn't participate in politics. It wouldn't, it would have seen, seemed unseemly for a woman to speak public, publicly about political issues. But if it had to do with reform, so aiding mothers, aiding children, um, et cetera, then they could reasonably insert themselves into those conversations because those issues were considered to be part of the so-called domestic sphere. They're part of the home. So women, and of course, when, when I'm talking about women in this context, I'm talking about elite women or middling sort women who have the leisure time to yeah. devote themselves to this sort of thing probably not a lot of really poor women are involved in this. Um, although uh, where I do find evidence of, um, you know, church groups uh, with women sewing clothing for the Greeks and whatnot, presumably that could have involved any woman or child who's a member of that particular church. So we could be talking about more than just elites and middling sort. But um, for the most part, those who are in leadership positions are going to be elites, right? So, um, but that role in reform, of course, does bring them into the public spotlight, right? And so they can uh, write to, you know, men and say, you know, this is an important reform effort. We need to pay attention to it. So one example I talk about in the book is Emma Willard, who uh, from New York, who was a huge advocate for women's education in the United States. She had written to the New York State Legislature, lobbying essentially for um, women's education. And then with the Greek Revolution, she wanted to involve herself and the ladies that she worked with in bringing schools to Greece. They believed that 
bringing education to Greece was one way of uplifting, you know, I'm using their language, uplifting yes. the Greek population. It's the first step towards uh, uh, civilization because they believed that they, of course, were not civilized uh, to the extent that they've been li living under Turkish rule. So they need to be lifted up into this, this status that they deserve to be in through education. So, um, a lot of women then become involved in the Greek revolution. They aren't so much interested in supporting aid for the military because that would sort of lie outside of a woman's purview, like actually like sending money for muskets or something yeah. like that's a little <laughs> unseemly. But if it's articles of clothing for Greek civilians or education, those sorts of things, then they were all about it. So, uh, and then from there, supporting the Greek revolution, that sort of organically transitions into, uh, you know, education efforts in Greece. And then uh, steeped in the language of the Philhellenic movement, we see women also then translating the language into the abolitionist movement. And then the women's rights movement evolves a little bit later but again we see the same kind of language of you know like greek women had been enslaved under the turks the turks are the epitome of tyranny um etc and so um if we supported greek women during the greek revolution to throw off the yoke of of the the turk then why aren't we supporting women's status in the United States, because surely we aren't saying that men in the United States are as bad as the Turks, right? Like men <laughs> in the United States are better than the Turks. So men, you need to step up here, right? And so that's part of that, the, the language. That's, that's really interesting. I, I think that, you know, what kind of struck me was I, I sort of had always thought of this as sort of a one-sided exchange, right? So there's a sort of love of the classics and Greece revolt, and so the, it gets support from these American and and British Philhellenes. Mm -hmm. But the idea, I mean, I'm really interested in this idea that that sort of also came back home, right? And that yes. the Greek Revolution becomes um, symbolically so important because of the symbolism. Right. And that's and that's what interested ancients. me the most as well. That, and I mean, it was sort of the 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 crux behind my argument. Of course, the focus of the book is the Greek Revolution, right? But I wanted to show that Americans in the early 19th century desired to be involved in international affairs. We tend to think of the United States as having an international profile as being more dated to like no earlier than the Spanish-American War. Um, yes. and, and even uh, many scholars still talk about the United States not entering onto the global stage until World War II even. So I wanted to show that that, first of all, obviously is not true. Um, yes. Americans are trying to concern themselves in the Ottoman Empire, in Greece, but the Greek Revolution uniquely poses this moment because it's so steeped in the classics and these things that they love and they're using this language to say to condemn the turks right mm -hmm. but then it it almost it like reflects back on them and people go well how can you say that the turks are these dastardly tyrants <laughs> when we kind of do the same thing here right <laughs> so um yeah, so it, it kind of, I, I not only wanted to show the United States acting as a major player on the international stage before scholars tend to talk about it, but also that it is this unique moment where involvement in the world and world politics inherently is going to have an impact. You can't just say that we're just projecting this sort of identity on a group of people and not be influenced by it. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, that I think that that idea that maybe in some ways, you know, it's the Greek revolution is a moment in which America had its own sort of, and I, I think you're right, I mean, not imperial in the sense of claiming territory, but own imperial ambitions are really awakened. Yeah. Um, is really, is really interesting. Um, just from the perspective of the history of Philhellenism and what sort of is going to happen. Um, we have 
um, we did a podcast earlier this month um, with Sebastian Matzner at King's College where he was talking about 19th century German Philhellenism hmm. and you know the ways the Greek Revolution um, interacted with the formation of the German state and that sort of thing. So um, you know sort of all that sort of focused on this little splotch of of land in the eastern mediterranean is <laughs> is interesting right? i mean yeah. Yeah. um we actually we actually see what greece is i suppose geographically it's it's pretty underwhelming um so um that, that's all very fascinating so in the next part uh, we usually ask people what they're working on now um, what's interesting and exciting to you at the moment and then if you want, and this is, this can be, this is us talking. Yeah. Um, we usually end with people answering. Did you ever watch Inside the Actors Studio? No, but I've heard of it. <laughs> so um, it was the, the, the host is dead now. I can't think of his, um, um, John Pavlin. But he asked these series of 10 questions at okay. the end. And they're rapid fire questions. So if you want to do the Inside the Actors Studio, I forget, we're trying to do it with all our guests. I forget sometimes, but. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. So I'll ask you what you're working on now, and then we can do the um, inside. We actually pull up the questions. So I ask you the right questions. Um, I'll ask you the inside the actor studio questions. This has been really brilliant. You're, this is really really interesting. I could have you all day. I know you have a life, but um, this has been really fascinating. So um, thank you. So that's all very interesting, and I could ruin your life and make you talk to me all day, oh, but no, I won't no. do that. <laughs> Um, I, I so what, 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 what's house, interesting? I, I love talking to adults. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm giving you my mother's number. She might, she might disagree. Um, what are, what, what are you working on now? What's exciting to you now? As much as anything can be exciting at this moment, but yeah. So, because of COVID, that obviously has posed a lot of hurdles in terms of trying to take on new research projects. Something that I would love to look more into is the uh, maybe the dynamic between um, Edward Everett and George Bethune English. It's something that I talk about in the book. Uh, George Bethune English is this, um, well, Everett and English both were Harvard students together. Uh, English, it's unclear why or what happens, but he has sort of this in this identity crisis. He ends up rejecting Christianity. He writes a whole pamphlet about it saying that Christianity is wrong and that Judaism is closer to correct. Uh, in fact, it's a very combative pamphlet where he basically says, let, let any man try to prove me wrong. Well, Edward Everett steps up to the plate, who of course comes to be the head of the Philhellenic movement in the United States later on. And he basically responds with his own pamphlet and says, yeah, no, this is where you're wrong and do to do to do. So I'm guessing that English becomes sort of persona non grata because he's excommunicated from his church. And it's shocking that he has rejected, rejected Christianity at this time, right? So he leaves the United States and listen to the Marines is in the Mediterranean. And then he for whatever reason, leaves the Marines and joins Muhammad Ali Pasha's army in Egypt and supposedly converts to Islam and takes the Muslim name Muhammad Effendi. And then he ends up the secret agent uh, a little while later for the Monroe administration where he is trying to negotiate a trade agreement between the United States and the Ottoman Empire, which of course is in a huge conflict with the Philhellenic movement. And so we have like this simultaneous Greek agents are being sent through an escort by the Mediterranean squadron, the US Mediterranean squadron. And then on the same ship, George Bethune English is on board the ship pretending to just be an American tourist, but really he's this secret agent, agent who's trying to negotiate trade with uh, the Turks. And he, because, his, because of his, uh, uh, role in the Egyptian army, he knows some of these Ottoman officials. Uh, he knew the, the race of Fendi, for example, or I'm sorry, the uh, Capudan Pasha, the head of the, the Ottoman Navy. So it's, I would love to know more about these 
um, because he's not enough. He's not an ambassador, but he does have the consent of the U.S. government to be a secret agent. And um, and then you have Edward Everett, who desperately wanted to be an agent to Greece. And both Monroe and John Quincy Adams end up having to say, no, we kind of want that trade agreement with the Turks. And if we send an agent on behalf of the United States, they're going to say no. <laughs> so if we're like, if we officially support in any way the Greek Revolution, the Sultan is not going to be happy. And in fact, I, I, I came across in the British archives, even the Sultan bristling at the United States and their efforts to get into the Mediterranean. So anyway, I would love to write more about that. But um, COVID. That's fascinating. Yeah, please do. And when you do, raise your hand and we'll, we'll, we'll have you back because that is okay. fascinating. All right. <laughs> um, Thank you so, so much. I really appreciate your time. Um, this has been so fascinating. I could, I could talk to you all day. So oh. our custom is to end with the pivot questionnaire. Our custom, when I remember it's our custom, but <laughs> that's how customs work. As a mother, right. you probably know that traditions <laughs> work when you remember them. Right, yeah. Um, so these are rapid fire questions. No right or wrong. Okay. Um, so are you ready? Yes. Okay. What is your favorite word? My favorite word is whilst. <laughs> I, I, I wish that we used it more in the United States. I don't That's know why, good... I just love how it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. What is your least favorite word? Oh my gosh. Um, ooh. I may not have one if it's so hard for me to come up with one, huh? <laughs> um lover of language right yeah <laughs> words all have importance right okay <laughs> well we're gonna go with that yeah um what excites you creatively spiritually or emotionally i i get excited i mean in terms of um research getting to see going to the archives and actually seeing some of the source materials that people have had uh people that I'm interested in have had contact with. Um, one of the, the coolest things that I found in connection with this research project was um, I found it at the New York Historical Society and then also at, um, I believe, the, the, the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. These collections of receipts for oh, cool. individual donations made for the Greek Revolution. And it will list the name of the person, sometimes a little note that they wanted to include. Um, so for example, uh, there's a, 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 one individual from, it would have been rural Virginia, wrote to Edward Everett saying, I want this money to be sent to whoever it needs to be sent to so that it can aid the Greeks. And then he kind of laments briefly about how we don't have uh, an amazing Greek committee like you have up there in Boston. So that's why I'm sending you this money. So I just, I really like to, to get to know as much as possible uh, some of my subjects from that time frame. And sometimes that's challenging, especially mm -hmm. average people. That's, oh, that's really interesting. Okay, I, that's a good answer. Thank you. <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? Sound or noise do I love? Um, <laughs> these days it's probably the chime starting Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good noise. It means what? I get to relax. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There's and there's so much quality content on there. Right there. Is. Um, what sound or noise do you hate? I uh, hate most of the annoying sound effects my daughter makes these days and she's doing it to try and get my attention because I feel like again in the age of COVID I'm just constantly working so she has come up with some really creative sound effects to get my attention <laughs> and you're, which, you're, you're yeah, living you're living in the nightmare with us all so <laughs> um who would you like to see on a bank note Ooh, on a bank note um my goodness well, um, I think I'm going to bat for the women of the 19th century. Maybe we were just talking about Emma Willard. I think that she is 
a, an unknown for a lot of people, and she made so many so an important contribution for trying to advance women's education. Um, but of course, the, the Susan B. Anthony or Elizabeth Cady Stanton, or even um, Lucy Stone, who I mentioned in my book too, she she was an abolitionist and then viewed the Greek slave by Hiram Powers in Boston. And so according to her, viewing the Greek slave transformed her into wanting to embrace uh, a, the women's rights movement. So um, she, the, that impact of the Greek revolution directly influenced her into um, women's rights. So, and I think she's a, another figure a lot of people don't know about. So I, I, I have my I'm a Lucy Stoner t-shirt. So. Oh, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I should have worn it for this. Um, <laughs> right, you should have. <laughs> um, okay, two more questions. If you were reincarnated as some other plant or animal, what would it be? Um, probably a Pembroke Welsh Corgi, because I love Pembroke Welsh Corgis. I have I was raised with one. We always have one. So um, yeah, Pembroke Welsh Corgi. <laughs> <laughs> and final question. This is the point where we're going to get the actors to. So if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? You're in. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. I really appreciate your time. And I believe you're the second video for our, our commemoration of the Greek Revolution. So stay tuned for the rest of the week. And thank you again. We really appreciate it. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>